Rock Fishing Basics, how to set up a float. Hi, my name is Roger Osborne. In today's video, I'm gonna teach you the foundations for rigging up with a float when you're rock fishing. I'll show you my rods, my reels, all my setup, and I'll explain everything that I'm doing. I'm expecting to catch a few different species like brim and drummer, and maybe a few surprises. If you're finding this content helpful, please hit the like, subscribe, and the notification bell. Let's get started with today's teaching. Now I've popped down here today around high tide. It's actually about lunchtime. I've picked this particular spot because, you know, you've got really easy access close to the water. There's a nice wash that's just coming out off the rocks, which is good for burlying. And it's just a good place to teach, I think, and explain all about fishing with a float off the rocks. Now I deliberately have not rigged up. I've really just run the line through my runners on my rod and I'm gonna rig up from scratch and show you what I'm doing while I'm rigging up. Now basically this is the gear that I have when I'm fishing for brim and drummer off the rocks using a float. And the principles I'm teaching you for using a float are pretty foundational depending on what species you're fishing for. One of the most important things is being able to set the depth that you are having your bait under the float. So I'm gonna open this little gizmo and I'll show you what I'm doing. Now the first thing that you do when you're rigging up with the float is you need to put a stopper on your line so that you can set the depth because you really want to be able to choose how far under the float you want to suspend your bait. And the reason for that is, is when you fish in different places, the water is different depths. So you want to be able to have your bait in about the bottom third layer of the water column. You want it above the rocks so you're not getting snagged, but you don't want it too close to the surface. So I'll just show you what I've got in here. I'm just going to grab a float and take it out. Okay, so I purchased this tubing from my local tackle shop. It's fairly supple kind of rubber tubing. And what I do is I cut a small piece, like this little, little, um, like a little thing of rope. This would probably, probably last me for a couple of years because I chop off about one centimetre of this tube when I'm setting the depth on my float. I've already got a couple of pieces chopped off in the bottom of this little thing, so I'm just gonna grab it. And so we can start rigging up. I'll start with the first step. Okay, so you can see this little tiny piece of tubing. Now it's not rigid, it's quite flexible. It's a little bit like valve rubber that goes on a push bike, which you can use that. I used to use valve rubber for many years for doing this. So that's the first thing you put on your line. So I'm gonna grab the end of my line so now I've got my little bit of tubing here. I'm simply going to put my line, actually, through the bit of tubing, but I need to do that twice. I need to then loop my line back around and go through a second time. So I'll just hold that a bit closer. So I'll push that through. So I'm going to hold that so you can see it. I've actually run that, my line through that rubber twice. Can you see the loop I've made? Now, if I pull that tight a little bit, I'm going to wet it with my mouth. I'll show you why. So I've got my little bit of rubber tubing on my line. I'm just going to wet it a little bit with some saliva. And then I, that will slide up my line. With one loop around it, it slides relatively easily, but it's enough to stop your float in, in the one position. So that's the first thing that you do. You put your little bit of rubber onto your main line. The next thing now is to put your float on. That's the next part. So I've just bought one of these little bobby corks. They're, they're really inexpensive. You can buy them in packets of three for about $2.50 or $3. Now when you put it on, you want the red side. See, it's, you see it's white underneath and orangey red on top. You want that on top because that's the part that you're going to look at when your your float is out there in the wash and in the water if you had it upside down and you're out there and you've got white foam you can't see your float you lose track of it in the white foam so you need to make sure that it sits that way so and all I'm going to do now is poke my line through like that now you'll find I'll just pull this up 
Oh, let's get that out of my shirt. You can see there's that bit of rubber stopper above the float. You see that? So when the float hits it, it stops in position and basically when your line's in the water, your bait and everything goes down and the float will go up to the point where, actually I'm just going to pull that up there, your float will come up and it will sit where that rubber stopper is like so. If you want to fish deeper in the water column, you just pull and slide that up so that your bait is further down underneath the float. So the next thing we're going to do now is, you need to have a small amount of weight under the float because otherwise if you didn't have any weight you'd chuck it out and your bait would kind of just waft on the surface it wouldn't actually go down to the depth that you want it so the very next thing you do is you get a small I mean I just use a small ball sinker um, it's about the size of a pea I'll just get one out of my little um see when you go down the rocks with this type of fishing that's your whole tackle box a little thing like that so the next thing is really, you can see the size of this little ball sinker that I've got. It's about a pea size, a little bit bigger, but that's enough weight to take your bait down into the strike zone. So now I've put my rubber stopper on, I've put my float on the right way. And the next thing I'm doing is putting my little ball sinker on. I don't know how many grams or it wouldn't be an ounce, that's for sure. But it's only about one centimetre across in size doesn't have to be exactly perfect the size just a small ball sinker like that the next thing I'm going to do is tie on a swivel so my next thing I've put my float my sinker and I'm going to tie on a swivel I'm just really using a half blood knot or a clinch knot very simple so there's my half blood knot or clinch knot which has been wrapped around five times and then back through the other loop I do have a video dedicated to tying this knot, which is pretty much the knot that I use, I think, probably 98% of the time. The only other knot I really use is a double uni knot when I'm tying leaders. So this is just a little recap. I'm showing you the sequence of how things go together. I have my rubber stopper first, my float second, my sinker third, and then tied off onto a swivel. That's the order of things like such. Now I'm going to put on a short leader. I'll be tying a short leader to my swivel approximately 40 centimeters long or roughly 15 inches and then my hook. So I really, I really only want a leader about so long underneath that. Then I'm ready to start fishing which we're going to do because <laughs> I'm keen to get a line in the water but just want to make this really clear for you guys so it's really easy to understand. And you know, you could fish, you could set up this way also if you are fishing with a live bait like a live yellowtail and you want to fish for a bigger fish off the rocks, you'd still use a stopper so that you could set your depth, but you would just use a larger float and then you would um, have a bit of a weight under there because you want to keep your live bait, you don't want it to swim right back up to the surface, you want to keep it down in the zone that you want it to be. So now I'm going to tie on my leader. The hook that I'm using today is not a huge hook. It's essentially a 2.0 suicide hook. It's just a mid-range size because some of the fish that are biting might have a small mouth and even if it's a bigger fish it'll still get hooked by a hook that size and I'm just going to use the same knot that I tied to tie on my swivel which is the half blood knot or clench knot. So you can see now I have my little rubber stopper, I have my float, with the red facing upwards. I have my little ball sinker underneath. I've got the swivel and then you can see how much line I have before I have my hook. So when this goes in the water the float will go to the level of the stopper and this little sinker will carry my bait down into the zone where I want it to be. And when I walk over to the edge of the rocks I'll be having a look at the water and I'll be able to tell just by looking approximately how deep it is and then I will set my float so that my bait is maybe about a meter off the bottom which is pretty easy to do. So I'm, uh, I've got my rock spikes here. These fit onto most shoes. In, in my case I've got these lovely water shoes that I wear that are really comfortable. But it's really just a matter of fitting on the front part like that. It's got a little strap on the front there that holds it on. Then I've got to just, this stretches. I'm just going to stretch that out 
over the back of my shoe and you can see there I've got my spikes on there. These are super handy because you can um, put them on when you get down to the rocks. You don't have to wear them down a track or anything like that. You can just put them on when you get there. I bought these in my local tackle store in Ulladulla. So now I'm ready to go with my footwear. I've got my life jacket on. I have a hat. Although I think next time I'll bring a hat down where it covers my ears as well. Today I'm uh, using initially my bread, my, my bread. My bait is just some fresh bread. And I specifically buy the soft white toast bread. And it needs to be that day's bread. It needs to be fresh. Doesn't matter what brand you buy. Just soft white toast is the best. I'm going to put some in my bait bucket now and I'm going to use some of it for burley. So I'm going to chuck the crusts essentially. I use the middle part of the slice for bait and then I chuck the crust out uh, into the area where I'm fishing to attract the fish. Now so far in this video I haven't chucked a line in the water at all. I've just been explaining to you how to set up. But now I'm ready to go. So I'm going to head over to the water's edge. I may catch a fish pretty quick, but I think when the burley goes in, normally a little bit of food going into this beautiful wash, which you'll be able to see on the video, you'll be able to see what I mean by a wash or a current, because there's one particular spot along this platform where there's a natural current that goes out, and I can put my burley in there, and I know it'll drift out and draw other fish into that area. I also grabbed a packet of prawns as well, so I'm going to use bread and prawns. You don't need a heap, just a little packet like this gives you a good variation. You can be using some prawn and some bread because the sort of fish I want to catch love both of those things. So I'm just going to whack a couple of these prawns into my bait bucket as well. They're not a bad sized little prawn or shrimp. Now, I broke one of my rods the other day, unfortunately had something in the back of my car and crashed onto it but I specifically chose a 12 foot rod this is one of my heavier beach rods but it'll work fine for what I'm doing but it's 12 feet long and the reason for that is when you're fishing off the rocks it's really handy to be able to keep your line away from the rocks at the water's edge because you know if you get end up with a little bit of a bow in your line sometimes you can hook onto a barnacle or some kanji or something you end up getting snagged because you're unable to keep your line away from the rocks. So I prefer generally when I'm fishing off the rocks to use a rod minimum 10 foot long, but about 12 foot long. So I'm gonna head over now. Oh, thanks mate. Yeah, yeah. What's your, what's your name? Yeah, Ensign. Ensign, hi yeah, Ensign. My, my son, your, your big face as well. Fantastic. Yeah, Vanessa, oh, I'm, lucky I'm, me. I'm just doing a little bit of basic teaching. Okay. Really on how to fish with a float. Okay. Off the rocks. Oh. So just really teaching on that. Well, nice to meet you, Anson. Yeah, nice to meet you, yeah. yeah beautiful, you, beautiful yeah, day. Yeah. You always watch your video. Oh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. Thank lucky, you. Yeah, lucky Th <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> If you ever see me when I'm out fishing, come and say good day. I love meeting people. Just come and say hi. Happy to have a chat. Even answer some fishing questions. So now I'm going to start fishing and the first thing that I'm going to do is actually put a bit of burley in the water before I even chuck a bait in. So in my, pocket, my bait thing here, I've, I've got the end of the loaf for bread. I don't normally use the end for bait. I will use this for burley. So what I do is, I, I need to wet it, but just soak it in the water. If I was just to chuck this bread out without wetting it, you know what would happen, don't you? it would just stay on the surface and just drift away somewhere. Eventually it would get filled with water and start to sink, but the fish would end up miles away. So I don't want that to happen. I need to soak it thoroughly. And then once I've soaked it thoroughly, I actually mush it up with my thumb reasonably well. I just mush it up into kind of a little bit like uh, porridge, really. And I'm going to chuck that out into this wash here and just let it filter out through there. I'm going to hop up onto this rock just momentarily. Now this rock is soaking wet so it tells me that a few waves are washing up here. So I'm going to chuck that bit of bread out in there. 
I actually might do a second slice. I think um, I'll do two slices of bread out there as burley, so I'm just wetting it. Now I know I moment momentarily had my back to the waves, but I could see what was coming, and I knew that there were no waves coming. You can see the seagulls out there. The seagulls are eating the bread that's still floating on the surface because some of that bread that I chucked out was still a little dry. So I'm going to chuck some out there near where the seagulls are. So they'll, they will knock off the stuff that's on the surface. But thankfully, most of that bread will sink. So I'm going to have a cast now. But the first thing I'm going to do is set the depth of my float. I know that I'm not right next to you, but I'm going to actually decide how deep I want this to go. I'm going to set it probably, that's about four feet. I'll just do it fractionally deeper. So I've set my float about five feet deep. I'm just going to wait until these couple of waves pass. Because obviously when you've got a few waves that come in like that, it just creates a lot more turbulence in the water. And I just like to let it settle down and calm down a fraction so that my float is not washed around too fast. Otherwise, that eddy really works very quickly. Now, when I cast my line out into the water, basically, I'm waiting for a fish to take the bait and pull my float under. When the fish pulls my float under, that's when I lean into it to set the hook. Now I've tossed a bit of bread out there, so let's just see what happens when I plop my float into that wash. I'm going to be keeping my eye on that float, waiting to see if anything grabs it and pulls it under. And then if that happens, I know that's a fish doing that. So it's just bobbing around out there at the moment. Yeah, I've got a fish actually. Oh, sorry, I just had to um, adjust my, my drag momentarily. It's not huge, oh. but it's one of my target species today. I'm just going to jump down off this rock so that I can show you. Now that was my first cast. This is what's called a drummer in Australia. This one, ouch, they're very sturdy fish. This one's too small. This one would be about 20, 24, about 25 centimeters long. But the legal size limit for drummer is 30 centimeters. So this guy's about five centimeters or two inches under size. And they're very, um, they're very meaty. They have a lot of flesh on them and they're delicious to eat. So I'm just gently getting the hook out. So you can see I've taken the hook out. But what I'd like to do is actually catch a couple of, quite a bit bigger than that. But there you go, it just tells me that those fish are there. Probably the best thing for me to do is actually chuck him out into the deeper water. Which I can do easily from this rock, so out he goes. Yeah, he took off at 100 miles an hour then. Alrighty, let's try another cast and see if we can get one that is a nice eating size fish. I can see a couple of little waves coming along, so I'm just going to wait. Now the swell today is pretty flat. I wouldn't be fishing this spot here if the waves were much bigger. This is just a good size. Alrighty, so I'm going to whack this back in again. Probably wait for this next wave to go. Just keep my eye on where I am and where I'm standing. I'm just going to flick that little baby. I just cast it into a slightly different spot then. A little bit to the right of where I previously cast it. My bait now will be sinking down so that it's underneath the float. To the desired depth. Now my float is bobbing along the edge of the rock shelf here. If it was actually touching the bottom, it, would, um, it wouldn't float very well. It would just drag on the bottom and you'd be, be able to tell. Oh, okay, I had a bite then, but I struck and I missed it. 
So I'll pull my line in and I'll reload. I actually wouldn't mind chucking a bit more bread out there because it's still fairly early in this session and a little bit more burly out in that session. So what I'm doing is I'm peeling the crust off this piece. I'm going to keep the centre for bait and I'm just going to dip this crust in some water, let it soak up the water, make sure that that's nice and ready to go. It's like having an entree, you know, You've got to get their, their juices going. So I've whacked that in and let that just filter down in. Now I'm going to get a nice little piece of bread, put it on my hook. and see if we can get a bigger drummer or a, or a lovely brim. So we'll whack that out there. Yeah, cast it out past the seagulls. All right, so we're gonna try it out in that zone. It's always exciting doing this because it's, it's all visual and you know you've had a bite by watching the float. And when it gets taken underneath, you know that there's something doing that. Now I'm feeding a little bit of line out because my float is drifting around in that wash and it needs to be able to move away from me. So I'm gradually feeding a little bit of line out. I haven't had a bite yet, but I'm definitely in the zone. And what I'll do, if I don't get a bite, hang on, it went under. Oh, I missed him. Okay, time to reload. Put another bait on. And get it straight back out there. Now when I'm doing this, I generally, I kind of try different parts of the water that's in front of me. I don't necessarily cast in exactly the same spot every time. So I'm just going to flick it in a slightly different spot. Okay, well that'll do. It's not a bad spot. I'm going to pull it back towards me a little bit. Uh, go away seagulls. That's when the, the sinker comes in handy because at least my bait is sinking down low where the seagulls can't get it. Now I'm right on the edge down there which is, can be very good. But I've got to be mindful that my line doesn't get washed onto the rocks, which it kind of did briefly then. So I'm going to pull it in. I'm going to rebate because I got I was just a little bit too close to the shore then. I'll chuck that bit of bread out there. In a minute I'll show you how I put the bread on the hook. When I come back to shore. Okay, so I'm getting a few nibbles. Often you get bites from small fish. You're just really wanting to get a big fish in amongst the small fish. I can see my float getting whacked a little bit, but it hasn't actually gone under. So I'm hoping that I've still got some bait on. I think they may have stolen my bait, so I'm going to wind it in. Yeah, I've got no bait. So something small, whack the float and grab my bait then. Okay, a couple of waves coming out the back. I'm not so concerned about the waves, it's more how they affect the wash where I'm fishing, but look, I'm going to whack it out there anyway. Now I'm keeping my line up, I'm holding my rod up to keep my line away from the rocks that are in front of me. So you can see how I'm holding my rod up. I was watching that wave as well while that came in there, just to see what it was doing. Now I haven't had a bite yet, so really what I'm looking for is that float to go under it really quickly, something decent, just grabbing it and there you go. I had a bite then, but I'm going to put a piece of prawn on this time. Oops.
Okay, so I've got a fish here. It's not huge, but probably fractionally bigger than the last one. I oh, know, about the same size actually. I'm just going to hop down here over this place. It's easier to get off the rock over here. Now I've hooked another drummer. This time I mixed it up and I used a prawn for bait. And I caught this guy on the prawn, but he's also too small. All right, I'm going to let this guy go. Just going to wander over here and chuck him in. So, so that's two undersized drummer so far, although I'm not fishing at the best time of the day. I'm really here to do the teaching. Ordinarily, first thing in the morning, early in the morning or just late afternoon, just once the sun disappears, is the best time for this type of fishing. I need to reload with some more bait. When I'm using bread for bait, I use the crust for burley. So I just peel the crust off. I like, like to use the thicker toastier bread because it's a little bit thicker. The sandwich bread's a bit too thin. So I'll take the crust off. Just going to chuck that down here on the ground and let it get wet. And then I'll be using it for burley. Then basically out of the middle of a slice, I get about four baits. So I just take about a quarter from that piece put the other bit back back in my box but then I get the hook and I want to actually put the hook in the middle of the slice so you can't see the barb on either side and then I just really curl it around inside there and the top part I I compress the top part which is where the top of the hook is but I leave the bottom part soft and fluffy and when this goes out in the water this bottom part fluffs up and that's where the barb of the hook is, is down in there. But by squeezing it on top, it helps keep the bread bait on. Because the bread is a fairly, you know, it's really only a one bite bait. Because once they nail that, you've either hooked them or you've lost your bait. So, but I've caught so many fish over the years on bread. So many beautiful eating fish. A whole variety of species, oftentimes fish that you would never really expect to catch on bread, you catch on bread. So now I'm heading back out there. That was a good bite. It was a good bite. It had quite a lot of weight in it, but I um, obviously didn't hook up. Let's just try in that same spot again. Just out there and just see if I get a similar hit. Let go of it. Not what I'm intending to catch. Now, this is interesting. He won't let go of it. He's got that piece of bread, or he could let go of it. He's probably just caught him. I don't have any. I really could. Really, I could do, I could do with. I could do with some. Some. Oh, he's got off. Thank God for that. I think in about 40 odd years of fishing, that's maybe happened five or six times in 40 years, so it's pretty rare, but it does happen sometimes. And thankfully, he was only just caught in the edge of his beak, so he got off just with a little bit of a warning. <laughs> maybe he won't nick my bread next time or someone else's bread. guy in before he does me in. Oh, another drummer. This guy's a little bit bigger. It's probably big enough to eat. So this is a slightly better fish. A drummer once again. I'm just going to hold him so you can see him. They're a beautiful fish. I think this guy's right on 30 so I'm going to let him go. 
but you'd certainly get a couple of lovely fillets off him. Fantastic. A couple of guys come down for a fish. I wonder if that's someone I know. Yeah, we're not going to burn your road, are we? No, not at all. Do you live just here or do you... Um... Little drummer boy. <laughs> drummer number four. Okay, it's gonna grab a hold of him. So this guy's big enough to eat, actually. It's a nice fish. So you just lipped him, he was caught on a piece of bread. So I love eating drummer, they're fantastic. Beautiful white flesh. So I'm gonna be keeping this guy. Whoops. <laughs> oh, there goes a the wave. Just grab him. They've got lots of spikes on them, so you've got to be careful when you hold them. Okay, so that's what I want. Now, I've been catching smallish drummer. I've got one keeper, but I'm going to adjust my strategy slightly because the tide's going out. So I figure if I fish a bit deeper, I set my depth a little bit deeper and cast out further into the deeper water, I think I'm more chance of catching a bigger fish. So I'm going to go a bit deeper so that my float is probably at least six feet, sorry, my bait is at least six feet underneath my float. And I'm going to toss it further out because the water's getting shallower now with the tide going out. And I just think the bigger fish will be out there. So let's just see if that tactic pays off and I catch some slightly bigger ones. I've also gotten down from the high rock that I was on before and I'm coming down to a flat lower rock right near the water's edge. It'll be a little bit easier. I just keep my eye on the bigger waves. There's not many big waves today, but I will just obviously always keep my eye on the water. When you're fishing deeper like this, you, want, you don't want to wind the rubber stopper into your runners. See, there's a couple of little waves coming here, but I might just wait and let these waves go past. There's a lot of weed all over these rocks, so there's heaps of natural food here. There would be a lot of luderic, heaps of luderic along this shelf. Just going to see how these waves impact this particular spot while I'm standing here. I don't expect that they'll do much. But you always need to be watching and learning. See, that was pretty tame, really. I could have stood down here on this, on this lower section. It wouldn't have done me any harm at all to stay down here. So now I'm going to cast it out a little bit further with a view of potentially catching a bigger fish further out. And I've just done my drag up a little bit because if I hook a bigger fish, they always go for the reef. I don't want it to be able to pull too much line. I'm just watching my float to see if it goes under. It's right out the back of that drift. I haven't had a bite yet. So that bread is just drifting along underneath the float, waiting for it to get knocked off. I'm kind of drifting out in the middle of nowhere, no man's land out the back there, but You've got to test all the parts of a reef just to locate where the fish are. Hang on, that was a nibble. Uh, something small is probably having a go at it, but not big enough to pull the float all the way under. So I'm going to wind in. So I think I've lost my bait. Oh no, I've still got it actually, but what I might do is put a prawn bait on, chuck a little bit more burly out, Bearing in mind, I am fishing right in the middle of the day, in full sun, so, for example, if I was fishing here an hour before dark, 
I should think it would be better. But doesn't mean you can't catch a feed. Just going to mush up this burley. I want to chuck this out into the wash. I'll walk over here just so that that burley gets where I want it to go. Seagulls can't get it this time. Just going to wander down here. Get this bait out the back. Seagulls are trying to eat my float. Like, oh, no way. I think I struck too hard then. I lost everything. There's my float out there. Okay. Mm. Yep, I had a big bite then. I put a little bit of effort into the strike because I had a big bow in my line. But the line parted. I would say at the swivel because I got my stopper back but I have a spare float so I'm going to go and quickly chuck it on I might walk over this way I had a beautiful bread bait just wafting around there but nothing really grabbed it so I'll come up this way a bit just get in this cloudy water a bit more I might get back up on the rock. See you later, guys. See you, Will. See you, mate. Not... Yeah, you too, mate. Yeah. See you, Milton. Oh, well, I'm not getting wet. That's good. Now I've lost track of where my bait is. <laughs> Watching the wave. So the purpose of this video today was to teach you how to set up using a float off the rocks, which we did earlier and I've been fishing in the middle of the day, which is not the best time to fish. Still pulled a few drummer. Now there's another thing I'd like to mention when you're float fishing. When you cast your line out into the water, you want your float to be unhindered. You want it to be able to just drift around naturally with the current, which means you don't, have, you don't want to hold your line tight because otherwise you'll stop your float from just drifting around naturally so that bait looks natural just following the natural currents. So it's a balance between not hindering your float and also not having too much slack line out because when you've got slack line or a bow in your line and you get a bite, it's a little bit more challenging to set the hook because you're not in direct contact with the bait so you've really got to watch the float all the time and maintain the least amount of slack line as possible without actually hindering the float from drifting around naturally which is what I do every time I cast out I'm trying to keep my eye on how much slack line there is if the winds causing a bit of a bow if there is a bit of a bow in the line then generally I'll strike in that direction and try and wind up a little bit of the slack line when I strike when the float goes under so it's a little bit of an art to it, but certainly very enjoyable and can be extremely productive. I had been intending on casting out an unweighted pilchard today, but the water's just too clear. The sun's directly overhead and I really think there'd be probably very low chance of catching something. If it was, for example, an hour before dark down here, I wouldn't, he I wouldn't hesitate to do that, but it's just because it's in the middle of the day in full sun. So I trust that this has helped you, this video. I know I've had so many people ask me in the comments how to set up with a float. So now you know how to do it. I'll see you in the next video.